In many ways, the story of modern art begins with this great nude, Olympia, painted by Edouard Manet and shown in 1863. It caused an absolute furor, so much so that a rail was built in front of it and two policemen were put on permanent guard. Some critics said it was beneath their dignity to even talk about it, but most of them went absolutely off the deep end. They said it made a mockery of art, that it was depraved and should never be shown. Why were they getting so hot under the collar? Because when we look at it, we see something that looks rather classical in its pose, something that may or may not be so offensive. But look again and you realize there's a brashness and a confidence about this painting that really unnerves people. The format is very classical. In fact, Manet had been to Venice and had seen Titian's great Venus of Urbino and used that as a format for the painting. But whereas Titian's Venus and many other nudes painted in the history of art, the women looked quite demure, they looked away, they looked chaste, Manet's figure is absolutely there, in our face. As we look at her, she looks back. More confident, she returns our gaze. She's absolutely unmoved. In fact, her beauty and sexuality has a confidence about it. This is confidence through who she is, and the Parisians of the time would have known who she is. She's a prostitute. So they're seeing a woman of a certain social class who brashly knew who she was and proclaimed it. And prostitution was, was legal in Paris at the time. But hypocritically, people tried to push it under the carpet. Manet brought it back out into the open, gave this woman agency through art. Now, the usual way for artists of the period to give a nude feeling was to give it a sort of golden glow and paint it in a way that we would see as rather saccharine mundane yet sweet. The way Manet painted had a rawness of reality, which is what he's trying to reflect. So the critics were horrified not only by how the raw paint was applied, but also by the very modern nature of the subject matter. And let's look at that for a second. Let me bring up my handy pen. So what are we seeing? We're seeing a successful prostitute. Now, as a society, we don't like the idea of people being successful from ill-begotten gains. We don't want to think about drug dealers living the high life. We don't want to think about textbook publishers driving around in Ferraris. No, we want to think of these people as belonging to the poor, the working class, as living in their parents' basement. She, however, most definitely is not. And we have a lot of indicators. We have the background, which with the curtains, the wallpaper, etc., tell us that she's quite successful. Not only that, she can afford to have a servant. And let me remind you, 1863, this is not a slave. She is a servant, which means she is paid, which means the prostitute, Olympia, is particularly successful. The flowers are presumably from a client. Those would be incredibly expensive at the time, which means she's really good at her job. She's not just bringing in money, but she's got a following. The cat at the foot of the bed refers to animalistic sexuality. If there was any question at any point of what she was or who she was, the cat really brings us back and says, no, she's a prostitute. She has agency in her sexuality, something terrifying to the Victorian French of the period. Now, much like the Venus of Urbino, we see white sheets. Now, that's going to be a little bit off-putting because white means innocence and a prostitute is, well, exactly the opposite. But yet, we still have that glimpse of red, of passion underneath, as if she controls... Who gets to see that passion? Who gets to see her in this light? Now, this is not a control that we like to think of. We think of prostitution as something people do in desperation. They'll do whatever they need to do to get the money. But in this case, she doesn't need to. She's that successful. And that just doesn't sit right. But we also have the raw brushwork. Look at the sheet, for example. 
the grays and whites are not blended. The brushwork simply applies the paint. The same with this uh, duvet or other comforter. And the figure herself, well, it's entirely linear. There's very little detail giving us the figure. It's very flat, very unusual. So for all of these reasons, not to mention the jewelry and the gaze and everything else, this is going to be incredibly controversial. But that's also a great stepping off point because I want to actually compare it to the Venus of Urbino. Now, Manet takes Titian's Venus of Urbino and transgresses its paradigms to create Olympia. The similarities between the two are unmistakable. Olympia reclines in exactly the same position as Titian's Venus. Her left hand covers her genitals in that pose of the Venus Pudica, and the angle at which her right arm bends is the same as Venus's. In the place of the dog, we have the cat. The dog is napping peacefully. The cat with its arched back is almost hostile. Through his reshaping of Venus of Urbino, Manet seems to defy the strict classification of women and more importantly, their sexuality, something for which he received great criticism. The categorization of women is further frustrated as, Manet's, as Manet doesn't use the idealized conventions of portraiture in portraying her femininity. For example, her hair is pulled back, giving her rectangular face a very severe outline. We see soft black brush strokes that appear under her armpits, suggesting that Olympia has body hair, unlike contemporaneous paintings that showed women without any form of body hair. But perhaps most importantly, Manet rebuffs the viewer from envisioning the painting as realistic and getting lost in the simple enjoyment of the nude. Olympia is rendered in stark contrasts of light and dark. Gone are the careful, subtle shadows that indicate depth in Titian's Venus of Urbino. Instead, Olympia is surprisingly flat. It denies the viewer from entering the imaginary field of the perfected nude. Instead of the ideal nude, we see real sexuality, in which strict categorization cannot apply. And that's important for the period, because the Victorians, be it in England or Paris or America, wherever it happens to be, are all about reform and categorization, reforming the poor prostitute from the street and helping her have a good and respectable life. Manet has given us someone who can't be categorized. She's a successful prostitute. So why would you even consider reforming her? At first, Manet's Olympia doesn't seem so revolutionary, except for the stylistic differences from the paintings of the French Academy. However, by replacing the mythological nude with a prostitute and not yielding to the conventional contemporaneous stylizations of women, Manet seems to have used Olympia to protest against the categorical portrayal of women in art. By replicating the image of Venus of Urbino, Manet acknowledges the past and uses tradition to rebel against it. And he appears to have been ultimately successful. Because after Olympia, that traditional mythical reclining nude will never again recover its hallowed position. Manet has effectively started modernism. And it's inexorable relationship to protest. And of course he's doing that. Of course it's related to protest because he's a realist. He's acting as social consciousness. In a small way, his painting of Olympia is giving women agency or maybe permission to have agency in their sexuality, something that is missing in Victorian Europe at the time. 